George, why don't you and David come on up here? All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming for uh, our media partners. Uh, for your records, I'm Hernando County Sheriff Al Nienheis. It's uh, pronounced Nienheis, and it is spelled N-I-E-N-H-U-I-S. Uh, I do have here today, uh, as Denise mentioned, uh, Detective George Lugren to my immediate left. Um, he has been highlighted. He's been the case detective on this for several years, and he's been highlighted. Many of you have probably seen him on some uh, national and local uh, documentaries and shows about cold cases and some of his successes. Um, at any given time, I, I, I want to give pat him on the back a little bit. At any given time, to put this in perspective, he probably has at least in the neighborhood of a couple dozen uh, cold cases. Most of them are the most serious cases we have, and this is a good example of that. Um, <clears throat> But because we have a very small number of major case detectives that have years of experience, like Detective Loygren, he also has to, in addition to his cold cases, often assist uh, in, in many ways in current hot cases, as well as even getting some hot cases assigned to him, uh, especially the ones that are a little more sensitive or maybe will require a little more expertise to get to a conclusion. So. I definitely want to let everybody know how much we appreciate him here, and you'll understand why in a few minutes. I also have uh, our state attorney for the Fifth Judicial Circuit, Bill Gladson, here. I do have Commissioner uh, and County, our Chairman, rather, County Commissioner John Alaco here. Uh, I certainly, we could not do this without their support. Even something as simple as getting this room uh, set up is, is important in our partnership of uh, these types of issues. Uh, I also have uh, former detective, now Sergeant David Boyer with the Pasco County Sheriff's Office, and you'll understand why in a little bit. <clears throat> um, I think most of you know already that we are here to talk about the Jennifer Odom case, but before I do that, I've got to go back about 13 months before uh, Jennifer's case, before she was abducted, and in north central Pasco County, another young female who was getting off the bus, and she was in her mid to late teens, uh, she was getting off the school bus and was horribly attacked and sexually assaulted. Uh, brutally is, is an understatement. She actually had injuries to her uh, head and skull that were very significant, and she was left for dead. Fortunately, the victim survived. But her life was forever changed, even to this day. She was a true victim, a good kid. She actually moved from out of state to an area of less crime, uh, Dean's List, just a good all-around kid, and suffered this very brutal attack, a true victim. And these are the most difficult and frustrating cases for law enforcement because these are individuals that are not engaging in a high-risk lifestyle and are victimized. Fortunately, in that particular case, law enforcement was able to get some biological material and, of course, Pasco Sheriff's Office at the time placed that into evidence. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. <clears throat> Thirteen months later, almost to the day, on February 19, 1993, most of you know that Jennifer Odom in north uh, eastern Pasco County was getting off her school bus. She was a little bit younger. She was only 12 years old. Again, another young person that we've come to know uh, through this tragedy as being a water skier and just a good all-around kid. Everybody just loved her to death, and she was abducted. Of course, Pasco Sheriff's Office at the time uh, started a massive manhunt, and every agency in the Tampa Bay area was looking for the blue truck that was seen in the area by some of her classmates. I think every one of us, and especially those in law enforcement, can look at Jennifer as our our sister, our niece, our granddaughter, uh, and realize that, man, that, that is a tragedy beyond tragedies. Um, as we said, other students in the truck saw, uh, or other students rather, in the school bus saw a blue truck, and that was kind of the focus of the investigation over the last uh, uh, 30 years or so, because it was believed that that driver of that truck may have been involved in the abduction. Um, Six days later, 
on February 25th, the unthinkable happened. Jennifer's body was found here in Hernando County off of Powell Road. She, too, was brutally attacked and brutally, this case, this time murdered. And she was out in that field for some time. We're not exactly sure uh, how long her abductor kept her captive or when exactly the murder took place, but we uh, are relatively confident the murder took place in that field, obviously sometime prior to her being found. Over the next 30 years, Hernando County Sheriff's Office uh, detectives investigated Jennifer's murder. Every viable lead, including those that came from Pasco Sheriff's Office and or the Florida Department of Law Enforcement or every citizen from people that had some information to people that were uh, totally off base on this investigation, but they were all tracked down and uh, investigated thoroughly. <clears throat> Even some of, the case, some of the leads over the last few years were revisited just to make sure that the detectives didn't miss anything. I can tell you that the investigation never stopped. In fact, Detective Logan will tell you that on Friday afternoons when I was in the county and wasn't dealing with any uh, difficult situation at the time from an administrative perspective, I would go back to his office and if my assistant was looking for me, she could usually find me back there talking to George about this or other cold cases. And this was usually uh, the top of our discussion about what we'd done, what we could do, what we hope to do in the future on this particular case. Dozens and dozens, maybe even hundreds of items were tested and retested every time a new technology came out, thinking that, that little glimmer of hope that we might be able to get that smoking gun based on that particular test that was done. Hundreds and hundreds, and actually, if we dug into it, we'd probably find thousands of leads over the 30 years were thoroughly investigated. <clears throat> and to give you a little bit of perspective how much work was done uh, in in the last 10 years or so, Nick Mick came in, was about 10 years ago? About 10 years ago, give or take, uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children reached out to us and said, we wanna help. And one of the programs we have is we go into communities and we take these really old cases and we digitally scan every piece of paper so that you have it archived and readily accessible. And of course, we, we were thrilled to death that they would uh, be willing to do that. I don't know if they realized at the time what they were getting into uh, because the people who came and they had several people who came and did the scanning, <clears throat> they said it was by far the biggest case that they had ever scanned at that time and I don't know if the record's been beaten. Over 75,000 pieces of paper and to put that in perspective, think of the biggest book you ever read. Uh, it is probably a few hundred pages and this was 75,000 pieces of paper. Prior to uh, February of 2015 sometime, that biological evidence in Pasco County was tested and they got a full DNA profile. But that's only half the story. Once you have that profile, you have to have someone to match it to. So it was run through CODIS, which is the National DNA Database. And unfortunately, up until 2015, they had no leads on that particular DNA. But FDLE, um, we got to really send a big thank you to them. Uh, they took, they were looking through some of their cases apparently and found this full profile of DNA and did something that's relatively new and that is compare that DNA to uh, local DNA and see if they get any uh, hits as far as close matches, meaning somebody who may be a family member. And fortunately they did identify a family member who happened to be the son of what turned out to be our suspect. So um, in February of 2015, Detective George Loigren was contacted by then detective, now Sergeant David Boyer, off to our side here from the Pasco Sheriff's Office. And uh, they, they talked often, cold case detectives throughout the country, but certainly in geographical areas talk and brainstorm frequently and he let Detective Loigren know that they had a very solid lead in that original case uh, where the person was found alive. They were able to narrow it down to Jeffrey Norman Crum, 
Many of you may re recognize that name from the case in Pasco. His date of birth is 8-18 of 1961. Uh, the, the MOs in both cases were almost identical with the exception of Jennifer, as we know, was abducted and found six days later. Um, so he quickly, quickly, almost instantaneously became our number one suspect in the Jennifer Odom case. Detective Loygren, with uh, assistance from our cold case volunteers, and we have a handful of volunteers that come in and work several hours a week, they started an intensive, because heretofore, I will tell you that we followed, we had many suspects in the Jennifer Odom case over the years, but just none of them panned out. And Jeffrey Crumb was not one of the suspects that we had listed, so it really kind of came out of left field in 2015. But I can tell you at that point, Detective Lorgan started an intensive investigation that took several years. I think he interviewed every single person that he could find, and that was dozens and dozens and dozens, that might have known or been even loosely associated with Crum before, during, or after the abduction of Jennifer Odom. <clears throat> after a lengthy investigation, those facts that he gathered during the investigation were turned over to our state attorney, and, um, and we started collaborating with them. We work very closely with them because we want to give them a case that is not only good to make an arrest and make charges, but we want to give them a case that's prosecutable and winnable. And so we continue to work with them on a very regular basis, doing anything they could think of that would help bolster that case. Uh, and you have to keep in mind that both agencies um, have those hot cases that are coming in, and they have to be worked and the state attorney is no different. If they have a murder and it needs to be prosecuted, they can't put that on hold uh, to do some of these things. So it was a lot of work by uh, both sides. And I can tell you a few days ago, those facts and circumstances were presented to the grand jury. Um, those, uh, the, going to the grand jury is secret and what happens in the grand jury is secret, but I do think that uh, our state attorney uh, can tell us a little bit about that as well as maybe add a few other things and I'll let him speak a few moments and then I'll come back and kind of finish up with where we are uh, today. So, uh, Mr. Glass. Thank you, Sheriff. Sure. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Gladson. I'm the state attorney for the Fifth Judicial Circuit. That covers Marion, Citrus, Sumter, Lake, and Hernando counties. Um, I do want to start off and uh, cover a little bit of the ground that the sheriff talked about. I think the overall picture that has been painted is collaboration and dedication and hard work. And that starts with um, Detective Loygren, who the sheriff previously mentioned, under the leadership of, of Sheriff Neheis. The, the amount of work he put into this case, when I started talking with him about it, it was absolutely staggering. And if you think about it from a prosecution standpoint, 75,000 pages worth of, of um, you know, documents and evidence and things to look at is a lot. Uh, it's pretty much unprecedented. So I wanted to thank you personally for your dedication and for your leadership, Sheriff. I'll tell you that the Sheriff and I sat down a little while ago to kind of talk about this case. Uh, he as he said before, met regularly with Detective Loygren. Uh, but we started talking about it and kind of trying to size up where we were at and with what evidence we had and given the fact that the case was getting older and older, uh, we wanted to you know, focus in on what we could do with, with this new evidence It had a, a path for us to move forward. Um, also, it couldn't have been done without the Pasco County Sheriff's Office and the detectives there. Uh, the amount of work that they put into that case is directly related to us being able to solve this case. Uh, it's instrumental. I, I can't overstate how significant and important that evidence is. Um, Bruce Bartlett, the state attorney from the Sixth Circuit, whose office uh, handled that case and then continued to handle it from uh, conviction to repeal, post-conviction, those, those things are important. In fact, they matter to how we prosecute our case. So I just wanted to thank him and his office as well. And finally, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. I've had an opportunity to tour all the labs in the state of Florida for FDLE and sit and meet with their employees and talk to, talk to them about the work they do. Uh, I think they're often um, 
you know, perhaps underappreciated. I don't think people realize how much we put on a lab with the evidence that we collect, especially the way that, you know, science is evolving quickly. So uh, they deserve credit for everything that they do. Um, as the sheriff mentioned, the grand jury met on Monday. Grand jury proceedings are secret. In Florida, they're designed to be secret. There isn't much I can say uh, about, you know, I can't tell you who testified. I can't talk about what happened in there. I can tell you that they came back recommending a true bill, an indictment uh, for three counts, murder, kidnapping, and sexual battery. Um, presenting that case for our office was Rich Buxman. He's the chief homicide prosecutor for the Fifth Circuit. And Pete Magrino, who's a homicide prosecutor who's assigned to Hernando, Sumter, and Citrus County. He handles all three counties. Um, any homicide that comes in that's a first degree murder is gonna be covered by, by Pete Magrino. He's worked with Detective Lorgan in the Sheriff's Office. Since he's been in this office, he came from our Lake County office. The, the entire time he's been working on the case with them. Uh, and I can't thank them enough. Um, when we evaluate a case, we, when we make a decision on a case, particularly a case of this significance, we of course always, always want to make sure we have the right person, but we always want to make sure we have sufficient evidence to sustain a conviction, not just at trial, but on appeal. And that's an important evaluation. It's different than that you would get from law enforcement. It's a, it's a final, final conclusion because if you're gonna put that much effort into something, it needs to be done. Um, we feel, and we have, I have confidence that we have the right person and that we have the right aggravators in this particular case to treat it as a death penalty case. So that's something I felt that was important to get out today because this is every parent's nightmare. This is a thing that keeps parents up at night worried about their children. Um, having two kids myself, it's honestly, it's seeing the things that everybody that we see, it's, it's, uh, it's not good. So um, I just, yeah, I just again want to thank everybody who worked on it. Um, and I think I, I'll just turn it over to you, Sheriff. Yeah, we'll do questions, questions later. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. As the state attorney said, um, and this is a recent picture, and I'm going to show you an older picture in a few minutes and tell you why, but. Um, <clears throat> Jeffrey Crum was, uh, he's already serving two life sentences for sexual battery and attempted murder in that case we talked about in Pasco County that was uh, previously prosecuted uh, around 2015. He's currently charged in this county and is back in our jail, uh, charged with first degree murder, kidnapping, and sexual battery. Over the last 30 years, countless, literally countless, detectives and sworn law enforcement personnel and civilians and, and tipsters have had a hand in this investigation. Every piece of the mosaic, you know, the minute Crum was identified as a suspect in the Jennifer Odom case, Detective Lorgren went to work putting a mosaic together or a puzzle. And I can tell you that there was, other than the conviction in that previous case, there was no big piece of the puzzle. That was a big piece of the puzzle. Every other piece of the puzzle that got us to this point were tiny little fragments of things putting together to paint a picture that gave the state attorney and the grand jury enough confidence to indict Crum. We're going to ask our media partners for some help. Here is a picture of Crum, and let me go over a little bit about his history. As I said, he was not a suspect in this case until relatively recently. In 81, he uh, <clears throat> had an armed robbery in, in Hillsborough County. Uh, in 85, he had sex assault, kidnapping, false imprisonment in Hillsborough County. He had a, a carrying a concealed weapon by Tampa PD in 87. In 88, he had an aggravated assault with weapon and carrying concealed weapon. Uh, in uh, 98, he had a domestic battery here in Hernando County. 
uh, actually three of them, three separate incidences in Hernando County for domestic battery. He had a violation of probation on domestic battery out of Hillsborough County in 2001. In 2005, he had an aggravated assault with a deadly weapon here in Hernando County. And then 2015, he had a sexual battery with weapon or force victim under 12 years of age, uh, Pasco County Sheriff's Office. Um, so he is a, he's a bad individual. And getting ready for today, I wish I could, I was really working hard to come up with some words that would adequately describe these two particular cases and the individual responsible for that. And um, the closest words I can come up with are not fit for TV, so I'm not even gonna try to illustrate how we feel about an individual that do this to young girls, true victims. But what we need from our media <coughs> partners is to get this old picture out because there's two things that we're hoping to uh, uh, find. We are we're not surprised if there are additional victims out there. There's also a picture up there uh, to my left and your right. Um, we think there could possibly be additional victims, which of course would uh, help this particular case and also maybe bring justice to those individuals. But just as importantly, over the years, and I think we put out some information about this a few years ago, we have had a couple anonymous tips come in. And based on the content of those tips, we are 100% positive that there are individuals out there that have more information about the Jennifer Odom abduction and murder. And we would like those people to come forward. Now, it could be a couple reasons they had not come forward before. Maybe their interactions with law enforcement in the past have not been great, and they don't particularly care to do that. And, and or um, they're scared, scared of this individual. This is not somebody that would be taken lightly, particularly by a citizen who may have information about his criminal activity. But we really beg and plead for anybody who may have information on the Jennifer Odom case, or any other for that matter, but particularly the Jennifer Odom case to come forward uh, so we can make what we believe is an excellent case that much stronger against this individual to make absolutely sure that he is held accountable for what we believe wholeheartedly that he did to Jennifer Odom. And if anybody does have any information, they can call the main Sheriff's Office telephone number at 75, area code 352. 754-6830, that's the main number, and just ask for Detective George Loigren or our cold case detective, and he will be happy uh, to take that information. Uh, again, I can't say enough about him. I'm gonna have him come up in just a minute and maybe answer some questions as well as uh, Sergeant Boyer, and I also wanna give our chairman of our county commission uh, a, a, just a moment, but, and this is gonna take a while, but it will give you just a tiny glimpse of the width and depth of this investigation. We have some individuals and or agencies that we have to go on record as thanking for helping. <clears throat> and I tell you, when you ask on a case like this, it doesn't matter whether it's Maine or whether it's Pasco, people drop what they're doing and help. And again, as was already said, Pasco Sheriff's Office, we absolutely could not have done this without them. And as I said, our cold case detectives and our detectives talk every single day on cases and try and brainstorm and work together. Florida Department of Law Enforcement, as was mentioned, uh, their lab was jammed up on this and they certainly gave PASCO what they needed to solve that case, which again led to us solving ours. The FBI, over the years they have done a tremendous amount of work on this case. The Fifth Judicial Circuit, the State Attorney, uh, uh, Mr. Gladson, uh, he has always been available and willing to help and I will tell you he has uh, a record in the state of being very willing to prosecute and send true criminals to prison, and we appreciate that partnership we have with him. As he said, the Sixth Judicial Circuit State Attorney, uh, they have been instrumental in helping us. Bodie Laboratory, Orchid Cellmark Laboratory, Pinellas County Sheriff's Office, Dr. Aaron Kemmerly from USF, Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, Florida Department of Corrections, <laughs> Astabula Police Department in Ohio, Pacific Police Department in Missouri, Chester County Sheriff's Office in Tennessee, DNA Labs International in Florida, Bangor Police Department in Maine, Dover Foxtrot Police Department in Maine, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, Tampa Police Department, Lee County Sheriff's Office, Astria Labs in California, Dade City Police Department here in Florida, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, as I mentioned, 
Bibb County Sheriff's Office in Georgia, Savannah Police Department in Georgia, Madeira City Police Department in uh, Ohio, Mesa County, Mes Mesa County uh, Sheriff's Office in Colorado, Fairfax County Police Department in Virginia, Spotsylvania, Spotsylvania Sheriff's Office in Virginia, Newport News Police Department uh, also in Virginia, <clears throat> Lawrence County Sheriff's Office in Georgia, uh, Warsaw Police Department in India, Indiana rather, uh, Pandira, Pandira, I guess, County Sheriff's Office in Montana, Kings County Sheriff's Office in Michigan, Volusia County Sheriff's Office here in Florida, Duval County Sheriff's Office here in Florida, St. John's County Sheriff's Office here in Florida, Massachusetts State Police, New Bedford Police Department in Massachusetts, and of course, Jennifer Odom's friends and classmates have always been willing to step up and help us. So, and I, I can almost guarantee you there are people we probably, or organizations that we left out, but I think that gives you a little, in, and Detective Lorgren talked to every single one of these, and it wasn't a two or three minute call. Oftentimes went to some of these areas and worked with these. So uh, the work, amount of work that was done was uh, overwhelming. I think first I'm gonna have um, uh, Chairman Commission uh, John Alaco come up and say a couple words about the partnership that we have here in Hernando County. If you do a serious crime in Hernando County, every <coughs> county leader is going to work with the men and women of the sheriff's office to get justice served. So, uh, Chairman, you want to say a word or two? Thank you, Sheriff Neen Heiss. Thank you, Pasco and Hernando Sheriff's Departments. Uh, I'd like you to take a picture. I mean, I'll look over there at those pictures. Okay, I have, I have four children, three of them are girls. I have eight grandchildren, six of them are young ladies. That's not a number, that's someone's daughter. And I can't express the magnitude of the closure that this brings to her family, her friends, and to this community and the communities around Florida and around this country. You didn't know how to say it? Someone like that that can do what they did to that is evil. And I cannot thank you enough, everybody who's been involved, including my friend George here, for the work you did to bring closure to this and for this community and for Jennifer. So thank you very much. Thank you for the relationships we have with the Sheriff's Department and our County Commission. Thank you for what you all do to our, for our community and for the state of Florida and for this nation. These acts are not local. They're national, they're international, and we all need to work together and it's it's really, it's one of those things that really tugs at my heart. You can tell when I see all these agencies working together instead of in silos so that we can attack this evil that our world is seeing today. So thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, even, uh, even hardened detectives get emotional over this one, so. Uh, <clears throat> speaking of, uh, uh, he's not so hard, but he's, he's one of the best I know. And, uh, I tell you, he has a, a memory. I, I consider myself to have a pretty good memory when it comes to facts and circumstances of cases, but uh, uh, George blows anybody I know out of the water about the de minute details of very complex cases. And I thought he might come up and say a few words, and if you have a couple questions, he's probably not, I'll put you on notice, he's not gonna really answer a whole lot of them, but um, I certainly wanna make sure he gets the credit he deserves for the work he's done, the thousands of hours he's put into this. So, George? Thank you, sir. Well, I want to thank everybody who spoke before me. Uh, any of you know me when this comment was made about long phone calls, you know how I talk a lot, so <laughs> that's why they're all long phone calls. But, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank all my past and present and uh, partners and my cold case volunteers who've worked hundreds of hours um, and you find people of the press if you could respect the family of Jennifer Odom right now and give them some time to process all this I'm sure the sheriff or somebody else would mention that but I figured I'd throw it in there now just try to give them some time to process this we spoke to them yesterday uh, it's just after 30 years is a lot to to get through, uh, I guess shock is one word, happiness, joy, I mean, it's a horrible act that occurred, so you're not really getting what you want back, which I don't have that power to do that, which would bring the child back to them, but at least 
this individual is going to pay for what he did. But I know in the future they'll be willing to make a statement and come forward, and I'm sure they'll reach out to anybody here in the audience that they've already spoken to in the past uh, when that time comes. So if you could please give them that now, I'd appreciate it. Um, do you have any questions for, for George, maybe? Detective, it wasn't necessarily the DNA. It's circumstantial evidence that you put in the, the man hours to gather, the interviews. Can you just clarify that? Because I know DNA connected him to the first case. It's not necessarily the linchpin in this case. Uh, well, I'm not going to really, I'm going to not make any statements about the active case, obviously, because although Jeffrey Crumb's arrested, now the court proceedings are going to begin, whether it's six months or six years, the way the court system is and the size of this case and the magnitude of it, I'm not going to say anything. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, but we have to keep that all close to our vest, and when the time comes that there's resolution to this, then everything will come out. Detective, sorry about that. Detective, uh, can you perhaps uh, tell us what Jeffrey Crumb's ties to the area were? Uh, what was he doing at the time uh, that he had a blue truck? Uh, I will tell you, yes, he did own a blue truck. Uh, he was familiar with the area. He did travel the road frequently, and he did live in that area of Pasco County. Do you know what he was doing for a living back then? Uh, he was a drywall guy at that time. And just for clarification, Detective, so this Pasco case, he was prosecuted in 2015, correct? Yes. Um, within that case, I mean, how long, how soon after did you guys kind of target him with this investigation for Jennifer O'Reilly? Well, he became a person of interest immediately because of the two similarities in the case. And at the time, I talked to Detective Boyer, now Sergeant Boyer. We spoke about it. We went over information that we both collected from him. And shortly after, they would make, they would make their arrest on uh, Jeffrey Crumb. And from there, I began my investigation. Sir? Yes. Um, and you said that was in 2015 where he became identified as a suspect. That's, why did it take so long? That's like eight years. Well, an investigation of this size takes a long time. Uh, I like to try to dot all my I's and cross my T's and be thorough and do everything I can think of, things I haven't thought of, talk to other guys, collaborate, what else could I do? These investigations take a lot of time. Then, obviously, COVID struck the nation. That kind of backed up the court system with COVID, where no one was getting within so many feet of each other. There was a lot of non-live courtroom proceedings. Um, so once the Pasco County case was finalized, now an individual has a right to appeal. It's the, everybody does it. Once his appeal process was up, which took a few years, about three years, then there was a couple of more years on the back end that he had. And since all that has now expired, that gave us the opportunity to move forward on the case. Mr. Gladson can speak more on that if there's any more detailed questions, but that's the gist of it that I get. I, I, I'm sure you've had contact with Parker Lene many times over the last, however long you've been working on this case. Yes. Uh, how did they react to this news? Because I know that you know, they didn't want to comment about anything, um, even though Mr. Crump's name is associated with this case for many years. Uh, how did they take it? Uh, as I said before, they're going to take a long time to process it. They're, you know, they're happy, but also, I don't want to say shock is probably the best word. It's, you know, 30 years to have something of this magnitude occur. You're waiting all this time. And now, you know, we went there and it was pretty quick because I didn't want to get emotional. I told them and telling them. So I tried <laughs> to just lay it out there pretty quickly for them and give them the facts that we know and where we were. So it's a lot for them to just take in and absorb. I, I imagine it's going to take some time before it really sinks in. I know you've spoken to them in the past, right? So you, you know how they are. You you know, like any parent. This is, this is not only a nightmare for any parent. I mean, as 
Mr. Lanco said, I, ha I have six grandchildren myself, uh, three girls and three boys and two daughters. This isn't a parent's nightmare. This is a community nightmare. This is law enforcement, law enforcement's worst nightmare to have an abduction of a child and then everything that follows throughout the nation, probably throughout the world, but definitely in our nation. What does this mean to you, George? What does this mean to you to stand here today and tell us all this? Well, I'm, I'm happy that we're at this point where we're able to charge uh, Jeffrey Crum and begin the legal process on having him answer for what he did. Uh, and then, honestly, for me, after all this, I'll be back working on one of my other cases. Uh, <laughs> just to make sure everything's done that I need done here in the follow-up. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into a homicide investigation, more than you could ever know. Uh, even one that you could say you arrested the guy at that, on that day, the amount of follow-up investigation and subpoenas and search warrants, especially in today's world, it's massive. So in a case like this of 30 years, there's a lot more work that's been, I mean, everybody worked thousands of hours. My volunteers put in thousands of hours. The Pasco guys, I don't know how you could rally up a, tally up an accurate number, but it's, it's a long time. Probably a few years worth of investigative work with everybody combined. Detective, did, um, I know you said you, you can't get into a lot of the specifics regarding what led to this arrest, but was DNA and the technology surrounding the use of it and, and identify, was, did that play a role at all in this? It, it, overall, yeah, overall it, it did. Uh, DNA, absolutely, especially with new technologies today. Um, DNA is changing every day, every minute of the day. So overall, yes, I'll say it did. Did you ever talk to Crumb about it? Uh, yes, I did. But I'm not going to go into what he didn't say or did say. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. Would love to put a fly on the wall for that conversation. Well, that will all come out in, in the end, obviously. Hey, Detective, <coughs> a few years ago, Burt um, Bookbag and Clarinet was found on almost the west side of the county, Karen Hernando. Were you able to connect that to Jeffrey Crumb? Uh, that was found back in January of 1995, so oh, it's, it's a long time ago. Yeah, that's time warps for us all, I know, but um, without getting to any details, I'll say yes. Okay. Was there ever a time that you just felt like we're not going to be able to close this case? And, and how has this personally affected you over the last 30 years? Well, 30 years ago at this time, I was actually in California celebrating my son's eighth birthday. But as you all know, obviously with my North Florida accent, I came from <laughs> New York City. So uh, I didn't know about the case till I came here to work in the County Sheriff's Office and knew a little about it. And then when I became the cold case detective, I began reading it. And um, it's like any other guys in the room, detectives, you have take pride in your job. Uh, I don't sleep much. I wake up. I'm, making sure I did, gee, did I do that in this case? What else could I do? Could I do something better? You know, and it, you take it to heart. I take all my cases to heart. As I can speak for all the guys in my unit and girls in my unit. Everybody works very hard and diligent. Um, I'm, as again, uh, I'm happy with where we're at um, and just hope for the best in the future. Let's get started in order our case here. Thank you, everyone. This is, uh, as I said, this is, uh, Sergeant David Boyer, he's from the Pasco Sheriff's Office. Go ahead. You might want to talk a little bit about that first case and maybe answer a question or two. Thank you very much. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. My name is Sergeant David Boyer. I'm with the Pasco County Sheriff's Office, and I'm currently a, a homicide sergeant over in Dade City. Anybody have any questions for him? So, yeah, obviously, Pasco is very involved in this from the start because of where her home is located. What's this mean to you? Several of them have worked diligently on this case themselves. Exactly. I consider myself the last person to carry the baton across the finish line with the the, uh, the case from 1992 in Pasco County. So I'm very excited and proud of our partners in, in Hernando County. I'm also very proud of the 
Odom family that lives in Pasco, and I can say uh, for all of the members of the Sheriff's Office in Pasco County, we're just very excited that you guys were able to take this case across the finish line and have these, uh, this type of conclusion on its way. So we're very proud of everybody and very excited to be uh, affiliated with this investigation and our partners in our handling. Sheriff, I have a question. I don't think we ever said he wasn't a suspect because that, that, that from day one everybody's a suspect until they're proven otherwise. Well, we so I know I never said that. <laughs> well, I know that we were told that uh, you know we had bad information about. Uh, the fact well, I don't know who told you that, but it wasn't me. Okay. Uh, again, we we are extremely tight-lipped because uh, let's go back and, and look at it from our perspective. <clears throat> um. One of the best tools we have in law enforcement is, for lack of a better term, the element of surprise and making sure the bad guy doesn't know everything we know. Well, Trump was sitting in jail, but he was, what? he was sitting in prison on a life sentence. Right, he was, but we didn't necessarily want him to know what we knew about him or how much we knew or how much we were looking at him because if there's any glimmer of hope that uh, he will let his guard down or make a mistake or say something he shouldn't have, uh, that's for the detectives to decide when they're sitting face to face with him. It is not something for us to do in the media. So um, I do want to go back and say that uh, uh, to answer a little bit more, maybe not give specifics, but um, yes, the DNA in Pasco was absolutely critical to our case. It was a totally separate uh, victim, but it was obviously our suspect's DNA, and he was subsequently convicted on that. So that DNA is critical, and that's, I won't belabor this point, but you know, the last year I've been working hard to get rapid DNA here in Hernando County in our booking sec section to take some of the burden off of FDLE so they can co focus on items just like this, the familial matching of DNA and so forth. So that's, uh, you know, that's a, a, a critical proponent of that. But um, <clears throat> yeah, we, we um, have to constantly balance uh, what some people may call transparency with what it takes to get the case across the finish line. And, and we certainly don't relish or enjoy the fact that we can't release a lot of information. We cert I certainly, I would love to tell you everything that George did and what came of it and everything, but that will make his job exponentially more difficult. And if I were to talk a lot about the case before George finishes his case, it makes his job exponentially more difficult. And of course, when that does happen, um, <clears throat> you could make the argument that some of the items that were released in this case early on in the zeal of trying to get more tips and information, a lot of information was released about that case back then that I would venture to say that most agencies would probably not release today. Um, and it did, you know, ultimately we were successful and I don't think it hurt the case, but it certainly could have hurt the case in that case. Uh, do you have any questions for me before we conclude? Sir, uh, when you said there's other potential victims out there, are we talking about victims in this area? Florida? We don't know. You don't know nationwide? Yeah, I mean, this is a bad guy who is very violent, who enjoyed violence and enjoyed hurting people, particularly women, particularly taking advantage of them and, uh, and raping them. Um, and, you know, there's evidence in his history and some of it's part of the case that uh, he, he was very, very violent when it came to his, uh, his, his acts against women. Uh, so that being said, we don't have any specific information of any specific uh, victims, individuals, or locations, but it stands to reason that they're likely out there. But more importantly, and what I really want to stress, I think even more important than that, we truly believe there's one or more individuals out there that have information that would help add a little piece to that mosaic about what happened with Jennifer because they gave some specific information in that anonymous tip that we believe they knew something about this case that 
the average citizen knows nothing about. So if that person could come forward, uh, we would be eternally grateful. I know the state attorney would appreciate it, and the whole community would appreciate them coming forward and talking to Detective Loygren about what they know or what they heard. And frankly, anybody who's dealt with uh, Crum, who he may have uh, given information to, no matter how small, we'd like to talk to them, because again, that will add another piece, another independent witness to that mosaic of what he uh, either did or admitted to doing to individuals. So we certainly want to get that. And again, here's a picture of what he looked like back then. And so this is very important. If you knew this guy in the Pasco Hernando County area back in the 90s or late 80s, uh, get with Detective uh, Loigren and he'll be happy to sit down and talk with you. Um, and again, if nobody has any other questions, I know George mentioned it. Um, and I want to do a shout out. There's a couple of them sitting over here. <clears throat> uh, some of our cold case volunteers. We have people from all walks of life that come in, either retired law enforcement, a county, and they come in and they help George get some of these things together. And I want to personally thank you all. I know George, it seems like every time I go back there, you all are back there. And, uh, and I know George speaks very highly of what you've done in an effort to help him. So thank you, because we just don't have enough people to do what we need to do. So thank you all. All right, if there's no other questions, uh, again, thank you. And as George said, please, please, please be respectful of the family for the next several days or weeks. And uh, George will be talking with them, and when they're ready to release a statement, I think there's, they've already made a lot of statements on this. I think their, their position is uh, definitely uh, public. But uh, please respect them for the time so they can digest this and deal with it in their own way privately. Thank you all. Have a great day, and thank you for coming out. Sure. Is, uh, is Jeffrey um, from here in Hernando Yes, he is. It's in the Hernando Pay Jail. And will he be having a first appearance? Uh, uh, either today at 1 or tomorrow at 1. I think it's today. I think it's today. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you all.